Wonderful to see everyone. Wonderful to be back. Wonderful to be back. Um, so for today, I, being that it's Yom Hazikaron, I want to do something a, a little bit, a little bit different, a little bit uh, meaningful in the spirit of the day. And uh, uh, of course, our learning is Lulu Nishmas, the 4,216 civilians uh, that uh, have been killed, Hashem Yom Kamdamov, and the the staggering number, 24,068 soldiers that have been killed in uh, defending Eretz Yisrael and the Jewish people and all those chayalim, those holy chayalim, uh, the neshama should go to the highest points in Ghana Eden, assuming that they're already there probably, and the highest points in Ghana Eden, but they should be an aliyah for the neshama. You know, my, uh, my Rebbe of David Hirsch Shlita, who uh, we had the opportunity to spend Shabbos with this, this, past, uh, this past week, really a, a remarkable Shabbos. Yes. So one of the things that uh, and I spent a, a lot of time with him over the last uh, 12 years of him being my Rebbe, a lot of time, um, uh, although I'd, I'd love to spend more time with him, but I spent a lot of time with him. And one thing I noticed was that um, uh, in yeshiva, and this happened dozens of times, every single time that I was with him and he, uh, he met a chayal, um, uh, whether it be a student that just joined the shir or uh, um, uh, someone that was visiting YU or a, a chayal, um, uh, he would stop mid-conversation and uh, he would stand up for the fellow and he would say, I just want to take, uh, I just want to, I just want to um, uh, extend Hakar Satov and say thank you for everything that you do for Kali Israel. You know, and, and, and 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 witnessing that and seeing and seeing the sincerity and with it, it, it was for for me important in um, in uh, in in learning this lesson of of having the hakar satov that we need to have for the chayalim. And we we say every Shabbos the mishaberach that um, uh, sometimes you know I I question in my head all the mishaberachs that we have in shul. You know, uh, half the time you know people are talking during mishaberachs and. You know, and 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 we 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 sometimes do not give the attention that these philos uh, deserve. And these are important philos, very important philos. And uh, for the mishabera, for the chalei tzahal, I always try and um, and uh, say it with with proper kavana because we have to daven for our chalei. We have tremendous akar for them. We say mishabera avr mitzvah Yaakov, that who the one who gave who gave the brach was to avr mitzvah and Yaakov. That he should um, give brachos to the Israel Defense Force uh, and those that are protecting uh, Eretz Yisrael and and the Medina and uh, and the people in Eretz Yisrael and it's it's something that we have to daven for on on a daily basis and we have to be able to have that hakar satov properly to focus to focus our tefillah. So what I want to do today is I want to. Um, uh, provide just a, a few um, thoughts that we can perhaps carry with us, one or two ideas that we can carry with us for when we are davening for the Chayalim, uh, hopefully not just once a week in shul when we read the Mishaberach, but every single day davening for the Chayalim, just some things to consider, to think about, to frame our perspective on, on what the Hakar Zatov we have for the Chayalim is. We know the, the, the Medrash tells us Number one is we, we know the Medrash tells us that Ein Nisrael Negalin Aguda Achas, that the Jewish people will not be redeemed until we are one solid unit, until we're unified. Now, it doesn't mean that, that we need uniformity. In fact, it's, there's Makaros that would suggest that God is not looking for uniformity. Hashem is looking for unity, a sense of, of uh, understanding that. A Jew, no matter what they look like, no matter where they come from, no matter whether that be geographically, religiously, a Yid is a Yid, a Jew is a Jew, and uh, we need to have the um, same level of respect um, uh, equally, this um, uh, basic love and respect like you do for members of your family, even though everybody has members of their family that are a little bit different, it doesn't matter, we love them uh, regardless, and this is the way that we should be treating our fellow brothers and sisters in Kalei Yisrael. And if you take a look, the Rambam um, makes, it, makes it clear that perhaps Chayalim um, represent this more than, than any other member of Kalei Yisrael. The Rambam, the Holy Rambam, 1138 to 1204, perhaps the, uh, arguably the greatest of, of, of the Rishonim, where the Rambam 
uh, all the Rishonim are great, but the Rambam was, was unique, where he is talking about a prohibition that is a, uh, a it is a prohibition, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a, a startling prohibition, but it's a prohibition of none, nonetheless of being scared in battle. That a chayal, when he's out in battle fought, fighting a milchemetz mitzvah for Kla Yisrael, when he's uh, uh, waging war, um, uh, defending the Jewish people, there's a prohibition of being scared. The Ramam writes the following Mi, mi ha'ish hayira verach levav, that the, the Torah says that someone who is they're nervous and they're of weak heart, of, of weak constitution. So then uh, they shouldn't fight in battle. That basic meaning, they're, they're nervous. They're nervous people. The Ramam is referencing that's a machlokas between um, uh, uh, Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Akiva as to what the definition of um, a, a soldier who should not be in battle. So the, he's assuming like Rabbi Akiva it means someone who's, who's just frankly nervous. That's it. Such a person shouldn't be in battle. Um, uh, which, by the way, the, the average soldier is not, is not nervous. Uh, I, last night, we had the Yom Zikaron um, uh, event here at the shul, and uh, Tzvi Goldenberg was uh, sharing some of his reflections, and someone asked him, were you scared? He said, when you're in it, you, you just become numb. You become numb of the whole experience, and you're just there, you have to do your job. As a, you're not even thinking about, you know, you're not nervous, you're not scared, you just have to do your job. And, and that's exactly what the Ramam is talking about. He says that, however, he says a person who, who is not able to hand it, that someone who doesn't have that constitution to be able to uh, withstand the, the terrors of war, so then they shouldn't be there. That once a person goes into battle, they, their focus should be over um, uh, protecting the Jewish people, umoshio be'esitzara, and that Hashem will protect them in this difficult situation, v'yada she'al yichur Hashem ho'osem melchama, and knowing that I am here to do my job in, for the sake of Hashem, v'yasim nafsho be'kapo v'lo yira, they should put their, they should, they should protect their souls, and they shouldn't be scared. And now this is the key line in the Ramam. And they shouldn't think about their wife they left at home. And they shouldn't think about their children. They should completely eradicate all the memories of their family from back at home. Remove all of your thoughts, all of your distractions from your mind, and focus on your job at hand of the war. Rav Cook, Rav Avram Mitzchak Hakohen Cook, Zecher Tzadav Kadosh Lebracha, who's um, uh, one of the the first chief rabbis of um, uh, uh, the British Mandate in the land of Israel, and um, uh, Rav Cook was Rav Cook was 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 a great was a, a tremendous genius. He was a great leader. He was an incredible Talmud Chacham. Um, uh, almost unsurpassed in his day, arguably um, uh, um, uh, the most influential uh, Talmud Chacham in the last hundred years uh, of the last century. And uh, he passed away in 1935 when Rav Cook was learning in Velazhin Yeshiva. He was probably the, the most prized student of the Rosh Yeshiva, the Nitziv from the Talitzvi to Berlin. In fact, the Nitziv, generally speaking, the meaning in Velazhin is that uh, students were not wore tefillin all day. Great tzaddikim uh, wore tefillin the whole day. There are some uh, great tzaddikim in Yerushalayim, for example, they wore tefillin the entire day. Rav Scheinberg wore tefillin the entire day. I think Rav Nevensal wears tefillin the entire day. There are some great tzaddikim that wore tefillin the entire day. In the Minning and Velazhin, nobody wore tefillin the entire day uh, because Rav Chaim Velazhin felt that, that the students in the yeshiva were not at the level that, uh, would, that they would fall into the category of these great tzaddikim to wear tefillin the entire day. The only student in Velazhin Yeshiva that was allowed to wear tefillin the whole day was the Nitziv Let Rav Kook wear tefillin the entire day. He was Marsh Tzaddik. Every day he studied 60 pages of the Talmud in depth. 60 pages of the Talmud in depth. Most students in Yeshiva, they're lucky if they can cover 30 pages of the Talmud in depth over the course of the year. That's considered like a, a star pupil. If you can cover 30 over the course of a year, he covered 60 every single day in depth. Rav Cook was, was an incredible mind, an incredible person. So he asked a question on this Ramam. He says that it's so odd, the Ramam saying, don't think about your wife, children, 
and that, that which you left at home. Don't think about any of that. You would think it would be the opposite. You want to motivate yourself, right? So you want to motivate yourself that you're going to make it back home. So the way to motivate yourself is, I'm going to think about my wife. I'm going to think about my children. I'm going to, right? That, that's, I would think that's a great motivator. So why would the Rambam say that you particularly have to leave all of those memories of your wife and children out of your mind to focus on your job at hand at the war? So Rav Cook said, because when someone is a chayal, what, 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 what they are doing is when they go out into battle, they're there to be mekadeshem shemayim. They're there for the sake of heaven. And when you're there, you no longer, you lose your status. This is where Rav Cook writes. You lose your status of being a yachid, of being an individual. Rather, you are representing all of Kla Yisrael. You're representing all of Kla Yisrael. And therefore, your mind is not on your particular family, but it's on all of Kla Yisrael. All of Kla Yisrael becomes your family. You're fighting for all of Kla Yisrael. It doesn't matter what, what they're, they look like. It doesn't matter what their politics are. It doesn't matter. All of that, it just becomes um, uh, you know, inconsequential details when you're out fighting. When you're out fighting, it does not matter. The fellow sitting next to you in your platoon is, it, it could be that he is a, um, a, a, a Chiloni, or he's a Haredi, or he's a Datilumi, or it doesn't matter. At that point, he is your, he's your Achiv, he's your brother, and you're there to do the same job. You lose that status of being that individual. Rather, you're there to represent all of Klaus. All of Klaus becomes your family. So therefore, said Rav Cook, if you have a soldier who is going to only be thinking about his wife and his children, so that what they're essentially doing is that they're saying to themselves that I am not just a man. I'm not, you know, here to represent all of Klaus. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm here to protect myself and my family. No, then you've lost the point of what your job is. Your job is to be the representative of all of Klaus to fight for the Yichud Hashem, to fight for, to fight for HaKadosh Baruch Hu's people, to fight for his land, to fight for his nation. And therefore, um, you have to have all of Kala Yisrael, all of Kala Yisrael on your mind. So I think that if one wanted a lesson in Achtos, better than asking a rabbi how to get a good lesson on Achtos, probably better to ask, uh, uh, to ask a chayal um, uh, for, for a lesson in Achtos. I think because they, they figured it out. This is what the Ram, that's part of the definition of being According to the Ramas, part of the definition of being a uh, of being a chayal is to have this this kind of this kind of an act. So I think that's number one. Yeah, yeah of course. So it's in the Mish, it's in the Mishnah Torah, in the seventh chapter of the Laws of Malachim, um, uh, and it is the last entry in that chapter. Yeah, sure. So. I think that's number one. Number one is, especially when we're going to be davening, right? We daven three times a day at Semach David Avdech Amerit Atzmiach, asking for the final redemption to come, asking for Mashiach to come. I think that based off what we're saying now, I think that there is nothing wrong with having some intentionality when you're saying that tefillah, particularly asking Hashem to look at the schus of all the chayalim and the achtus that they represent. We want Mashiach to come. And we know in Israel Nigal and Achu Aguda Achas that the only way Mashiach is going to come, the final redemption is going to come, is once we have this kind of a unity, once we have proper achtos, we say we can turn to Hashem and say, Hashem, we as Kaisel perhaps are ready. We have 24,068 examples of those that gave their life for achtos, right? And that is, and, and that perhaps is enough of a schus to bring to bring Mashiach. So I think that that's that's I think the 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 first the first thing we can think about in having number one the hakar satov for the chaylim, but also how to channel that into our tefilos. I think is focusing on the achdos that the chaylim represent. Yeah, it's just, it's just there's that part in the in the bar in where it says which which people should be excused from from being. Yeah, that's what this Ramam is is. You know, there's the one if you're afraid. It's, I mean, it's interesting. It, 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 it sort of assumes that somebody could adopt that attitude of the I think they could adopt, adopt it. I mean, obviously, you could sort of picture it in the in the heat of things, but they have to be prepared to have that attitude. And, if, and you sort of think of a fresh recruit, you know, maybe wouldn't have. Yeah, well, I, 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 I think I think you learn the lesson very quickly. I think you can you can 
be, I think certainly you could be taught the achdos, mm -hmm. um, but I think that, um, I think it, it's, you, you figure it out very quickly. You figure it out very quickly. That's what um, our Rebbe Rav Govich, um, Rav Govich Shlita, who uh, fought in Sahal, he's a Rosh Shiva at YU. Uh, he, mar he married us, he was our Masada Kedushan. Um, he, um, he fought in Sahal, he fought in 82. Um, his, uh, his roommate uh, in Yeshiva in KBY in Karen Biavna is a Hezder Yeshiva where they learn in Yeshiva and they're also on the, you know, in the reserves. And um, his roommate um, has been um, uh, MIA since 82. Yeah, yeah. Yehuda Katz, I think is his name. His name's Yehuda Katz. I think you can, you can look him up. Yehuda Katz. Um, I'm pretty sure Rav Golov told us this, and I don't know if it's still the case, but I'm assuming it is that KBY left his his uh, bed and his room exactly the way it was, sin waiting for him to come back, waiting for him to come back. So, um, so Rav Golov told us that there are two places. There's two places that um, uh, you'll always find um, achdos. Two places you'll always find achdos. Number one is uh, on the battlefield says there is there is no, all the politics all of the hashkafas all it all just falls away it all melts away Achtos is is you'll never find a better place than the battlefield he says and in the hospital those are the two places he says that you can learn a lesson in Achtos. um uh, so that's number one is focusing on the high limbs uh, Achtos that they represent number two is we know that, uh, you know, we know today is Yom Azikaron, but um, uh, the name Yom Azikaron, I think, is, uh, borrow, is a borrowed term from a, uh, a much older Yom Azikaron than, than the, the Memorial Day that we're observing today. Uh, it comes from the Torah. We know that there's already a Yom Azikaron, Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is called Yom Hazikaron, right? And we say it in Musaf, right? Yom Hazikaron Azeh, the day of remembrance. Now, what we're talking about there is that we're asking Hashem to remember the schus avos, remember all of our merits when going through the judgment. Hashem, remember all the schus avos, remember all the merits of our forefathers have carried. And, uh, um, uh, you know, beschus, all the, all the avos, Hashem, you should give us a proper judgment. This part, part of the, one of the main themes of of, uh, of Rosh Hashanah. In fact, it's one of the three main themes of Malchiot, God, God's kingship. Malchiot, Zichronot is number two. The remembrances of the Schus Avos, of the merits of our forefathers. And Shofrot is number three, the Shofar, that uh, intense tefillah with Hashem. Uh, it's Yom Zikaron. Rosh Hashanah is Yom Zikaron. And uh, when in Rosh Hashanah, when we um, are going through the, the Zikaron, there is one Zikaron, there is one merit that we always come back to. We always come back to is Akedas Yitzchak. That Beschus Akedas Yitzchak Kuya Aneinu. That Hashem should answer us, Hashem should give us proper judgment in the merit of Akedas Yitzchak. And in fact, we say in the Tefillah the following. Vitira, viti, vi, that Hashem, you should see, we should put before you the, the Akeda, that Avram Avinu bound up Yitzchak on the altar. Hashem, you should also take the same approach with us, that the same approach you had with Yitzchak, that you spared his life over the fact that Avram showed that Messiah Snefesh, Yitzchak Avinu showed that Messiah Snefesh, and you spared his life, so too, Hashem, please. Hashem, you should remove all anger that you would have on us as well. And the Rabbeinu B'chayo writes in his introduction to the Parsha of the Akedah, Rabbeinu B'chayo writes, he says, Zuhi Parshas Akedah, this is the Parsha of the Akedah, Asher Yisrael B'tuchim, that that the Jewish people are guaranteed, guaranteed, that the merit of the Akedah will always protect us in every generation. The Akedah is always protecting us. And then we continue further. The Medrash writes that 
all of the merit that the Jewish people, have, all the, the good things the Jewish people have experienced in this world, and I'm Ochlem, are the only reason that we have them. Elabasos Osa Ma'achelas is due to the fuel that was used for the Akedah. That the Akedah is the reason why anything that has ever gone good for Kaiso, you could pin it partially on the Akedah. That we're asking Hashem to, we're trying to elicit all of the memories of the Akedah, the merit of the Akedah, so that Hashem should pass good judgment on us. The Barabin Machaya says it's the reason why we can guarantee HaKadosh Baruch Hu is always going to take care of the Jewish people, pinning on the Akedah. Now, if you take a step back and you think about that, it was not the only test that Avram Binu passed. It wasn't the only test. There were 10 tests that Avram Binu passed. So then why is it that, that we pin so much on the Akedah? Now, granted, it was, it was, it was very great. But you know what? There is a medrash in the Yalkut Shemoni that actually suggests that perhaps the first of the Nisyonos of Lech Lecha, that we read in the Torah, of Lech Lecha, most, maybe not the first of the Nisyonos that Avram Avinu had, the first of the tests, but the first one that we read about of Lech Lecha, that it was perhaps even greater than the Akedah. That there's one opinion in the medrash in the Yalkut Shemoni says that Lech Lecha was even greater than the Akedah. And, and the, the, the basic message of that medrash is that, well, how could you even think such a thing? The Akedah, slaughter your only child that was promised that was going to be the one that was going to be the progenitor of the Mesora, right? That is perhaps not as great as Lechacha. So um, many of the fortune point out that according to that opinion that says Lechacha was an even greater test is because it was the first, right? And starting something is right once Avraminu got to the Akeda, he already had this relationship with Akadish Baruch, Hu, right? It wasn't God had already spoken to Avram multiple times at that point. He was already uh, he, he had the 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 brisbane of Asarim, he, he had the bris meal at that point. There was already this relationship that was unsurpassed in human history between a mortal and, and God, that the Akeda was just another one, versus the first one, perhaps is even greater. So then if that's the case, so then why is it that, that, that we are pinning so much on the Akedah? Why don't we talk during Rosh Hashanah? We should talk more about Lach Lecha. Right? One opinion of the Medrash says that it was perhaps an even greater Nisayon. It was the first one. So why is that we keep coming back to the Akedah? So, so I saw in Rav, uh, Rav Mursky's Sefer, Higyon HaLacha, Rav Mursky, um, uh, and I have, uh, have Hakar Satov to... Uh, my uh, one of my rabbeim, one of my first rabbeim, uh, Ra Rabbi Avi Perlowitz, um, uh, who married uh, um, uh, married Ezra and Batsheva, right? Um, uh, he gave me this as a gift, the Sefer Yone Halacha. Um, uh, this is going back uh, um, uh, thirteen years ago. He gave me the Sefer, so I just found this incredible uh, comment from Rav Mursky, who was the Rosh Hashiva of uh, BMT, which is one of like the original. Uh, gap year yeshivas in Israel. So he writes a beautiful explanation. Why is it that we could pin so much? Why we do pin so much on the Akedah? He says, because there are many Gemaras and, and, and many Midrashim that um, uh, always use an illustration of this kind of like conflict that takes place as to whether or not Hashem should rule in favor of the Jewish people or against the Jewish people. And it, pu and it puts it in the illustration of a Tategor and Sanegor, a prosecutor and a defendant. And that's, that, that is like the, the illustration that's used for this um, dichotomy and this conflict and this complexity as to how Hashem um, does his judgment on the Jewish people. And, the, and Rav Mursky says, perhaps using that illustration, we can understand why we're pinning so much on the Akedah. He writes the following. He says, Mikan teshuva l'sheh senu." That now, perhaps using this illustration, we can answer our question on Dvar Ma'alaso Shel Ha'akeda as to why the Akeda was so great. Al Shar Nisyonos, perhaps even greater than all the other Nisyonos. He says, Im shal Because let's say the Jewish people wanted to pin all of their merits on Lechlecha. So the prosecutor, the Kategor, can respond to that. It wouldn't be a good defense. Kai, so that would be a, a bad defense for our defense team to use Lechacha. Why? Because what was the Nisan of Lechacha? Kadosh Baruch Hu testing Avram to leave your comfort zone and go to Eretz Yisrael. 
Are all of the Jewish people doing that? No, right? I'm not doing that. And why is it that we're, we're, we're there are Joe, the, the, those living in, in Chutzlarts? What's the rationale for living in Chutzlarts? And there's very good rationales for living in Chutzlarts. But bottom line, we're not living in Eretz Israel. And there's very good rationales. And probably tonight, I think we're going to do is for the life's biggest questions, we're going to discuss the big question of uh, when, when we know to make Aliyah. We're going to start this mini series probably tonight. Um, uh, to take us over the next couple of weeks uh, in, in honor of Yom Ha'atzmaut. That when, when, when to know to make Aliyah. It's a very, very important question. That's going to be the, the mini-series we're going to embark on tonight for Life's Biggest Question. So there's very, very good rationale as to why uh, people do or don't make Aliyah. Okay, fine. But bottom line, where do you live? I live in La Jolla. I live in La Jolla. I don't live in Eretz So if we say to... If the process, if 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 we're gonna, if our defense team is gonna say to the judge, Takarish Baruch you should give merit to Klai Yisrael based off of the fact that Avram Vinu did lachacha. What's the prosecutor? What's the kategor gonna come in and say? Yeah, but are they still doing it? No, some of them are, but not everybody. So it wouldn't be a good defense. No, it's Eretz Yisrael. You're going to Eretz Yisrael, sure. So, so then what's the, what's the, the, so then what defense can we use in our favor? We go through all of the, all the tests. There's one that we continue to do and not only continue to do, but we have compounded the Nisayon. We've made it even greater and it's been exponentially multiplied times an unquantifiable amount perhaps even beyond the original Akedah itself. You know what that is? Klai Yisrael giving their life for HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And that's something that continues to happen. So our defense team is much smarter and says, we are going to come to you, Hashem, and say, Hashem, answer our tefillos, give proper judgment to the Jewish people. B'schut Akedah Tzitzchak. There, the prosecutor has nothing to say about that. There's nothing to say. What are you going to say? They're not still doing it. They are. This is what Ramersky writes. He says, "Rock bin Yisrael Hakeda, Kishaba Am Yisrael Las Hir Zechut Nisayon Zeh." When we come before Hashem and say, "Hashem, answer our tefilos over the merit of the Akeda," Kan Mish Mishtateg Hakategor Viika Chasenei Yer Mekormar. Here, the prosecutor needs to sit down, and the defense attorney stands up. And he says, He says to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he makes his argument, he says, Akedos We have an unquantifiable amount of Akedos that continue to take place in Klai Yisrael. Going back to the earliest parts of our history, all the way to the, the, all the, way to the, the Crusades. The Ad Me'onei Ha... Ha Inquisatia and on and all of the Akedos that happened through the Inquisition, the Ar Kedoshi Hashoah, and all of the Kedoshim, all of the Akedos, the six million Akedos that took place by the Shoah, the Ad Mesiris Nafshim Shal Chayle Yisrael, and every single Chayal that steps up to the plate, every single one of them, it's Akedos Yitzchak happening over and over and over again. Elahem ban of Shalavram Avinu says the Sanegor says the says the defendant. These are the children of Avram Avinu. Shemasru nafsham al shimcha yisparach. That this is what the Jewish people do. We sacrifice our lives for the sake of our Kaddish Baruch Hu. Kan en la kategor malaheshiv. Here the prosecutor has no response, and that's why we always come back to the akeda. So I think this is number two. Number two is that we want to have Hakar Satov and we want to be able to focus our tefillos to, to, um, uh, to daven for the Chayalim. What we're saying to Hashem when davening for Mashiach is Hashem, look at every single Akeda Yitzchak that happens on a daily basis in Kal Yisrael. And Biskus Akeda Hu Ya'anenu, Hashem, you're going to bring Mashiach. That's unbelievable. That's unbelievable. And there's, there's an incredible story that I'll read that I, I've shared in the past, but it is worth reviewing this story on every day. This is an incredible story about Professor, Professor Alman, excuse me. 
Professor Alman and Rav Gusman. So Rav Gusman, just a little bit of backstory. Rav Gusman, Rav Yisrael Zev Gusman, Zecher Tzav, the Kodesh Levracha, is a Holocaust survivor. When he was 17 years old, he was appointed to be one of the Dayanim, one of the rabbinical judges on the highest rabbinical court in Eastern Europe, on Rav Chaim Ozergudinsky's Bezdin. I mean, it's just, just being able to be appointed to that Bezdin, it's like being appointed to the Supreme Court. He was 17 years old. He was a mind like you wouldn't believe. When you read his Sfarim, Rav Hirsch Shlita enjoys his Sfarim a lot. Rav Schefter enjoys his Sfarim. I've learned from his Sfarim a lot, especially on Bava Metzia. His Sfarim are like, are, are incredible because they're, they're, the, the breadth and depth of his knowledge is just like, you're clearly reading someone that, you know, was from another generation. It's unbelievable. So Rav, uh, Rav Gusman, he, um, he survived the war by hiding in the forest for eight months. I think Rav Hirsch told the story over Shabbos, over um, uh, um, uh, how he was able to have a karsatov for all the vegetation that was in the forest because it saved his life. And um, after the war, he, he um, first came to the United States, had a small yeshiva in Brooklyn, and then later made Aliyah and started a yeshiva in Netzach. He saw that's still functioning today on Rechov Ramban in, um, uh, in Rechavia. On Rechov Ramban, yeshiva Netzach Yisrael. It's been, um, uh, the, the building has been updated. And it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful building, a beautiful base measure. They have an incredible library. Um, I was at the yeshiva a few years ago. It's an incredible library. And, um, uh, and outside the yeshiva, there were those bushes that, that those are the bushes we first was talking about that Rav Gusman would water himself to show a karsito for the berries. So in the yeshiva Netzach Yisrael, Rav Gusman in Rechavia didn't just only focus on his students, but he had these community programs that like a lot of yeshivas continue to do today to have uh, community members come and learn with the Rosh Yeshiva to come learn with Rav Gusman. And one of those people was, since you had professionals and you had uh, professors, and so one of those people was Professor Alman, who actually won the Nobel Prize in economics. Um, it was a very, very smart man. His, uh, one of his nephews is a close friend of mine from Edison, New Jersey. So anyway, Professor Alman um, uh, um, and Rav Gusman shared a very close relationship. So that's all the backstory we need for, um, uh, for the story. So I'll begin reading. This is an article. The, the, this story appears in many, many different places. This particular uh, version of the story, but it's, they're all pretty much the same. Um, uh, I found um, that Aish had a, had a nice uh, write-up about the story. The year was 1982. This is the same war that um, um, uh, Rav Goldich and his roommate Yehuda Katz um, um, uh, were, were fighting in. The year was 1982. Once again, Israel was at war. Soldier, soldiers were mobilized. Reserve units activated. Among those called to duty was a reserves soldier, a university student who made his living as a high school teacher, Shlomo Alman, Professor Yisrael Alman's son. Shlomo Alman, Professor Alman's son, was called up to war. On the eve of the 19th of Sivan, in particularly fierce combat, Shlomo fell in battle. It's in Shamashko, the highest points in Eden. Rav Gusman mobilized his yeshiva. All his students joined him performing the mitzvah of Kavur Sames, of going to the Leviah. At the cemetery, Rav Gusman was agitated. He surveyed the rows of graves of the young men, this is on Har Herzl, soldiers who died defending the land. On the way back from the cemetery, Rav Gusman turned to another passenger in the car and said, they're all holy. Another passenger questioned the rabbi, even the non-religious soldiers? Rav Gusman replied, every single one of them. He then turned to the driver and said, take me to Professor Alman's home. The family had just returned from the cemetery and would now begin the week of Shiva, mourning their son, brother, husband, and father. Shlomo was married and had one child. His widow, Shlomit, gave birth to their second daughter shortly after he was killed. Rav Gusman entered and asked to sit next to Professor Alman, who said, Rabbi, I so appreciate your coming to the cemetery but now it's time for you to return to your yeshiva. Rav Gusman spoke first in Yiddish and then in Hebrew so those assembled would understand. I'm sure that you don't know this, but I had a son named Mayer. This is Rav Gusman talking. I had a son named Mayer. He was a beautiful child. He was taken from my arms and executed. By the way, that story is, I only share this story about his son on, on Tisha B'Av. It's too heart-wrenching 
to talk about that story he's referencing right now. That is a story for another time on Tisha B'Av. He was taken my, from my arms and executed. I escaped. I later bartered my, char, my child's shoes so that we would have food. But I never was able to eat the food. I gave it away to others. My mayor is a kadosh. He's holy. He and all six million who perished are holy. Rav Gusman then added, but I will tell you what's transpiring right now in the world of truth in Gan Eden in heaven. My mayor is welcoming your Shlomo into the minion and saying to him, I died because I am a Jew, but I wasn't able to save anyone else. But you, Shlomo, you died defending the Jewish people and the land of Israel. My mayor is a Kadosh. He is holy. But your Shlomo is the Shliach Tzibor. He is the Chaza in the heavenly minion. Rav Gusen continued, I never had the opportunity to sit Shiva for my mayor. Let me sit here with you for just a little longer. That, I think, is the perfect illustration for what we're talking about of the Akedos that continue to take place for Klai. So that, that in and of itself is what we're trying to elicit. That mercy from Hashem is what we're trying to elicit in Mashiach's imminent arrival, God willing. So that's number two is to think about and consider how the Chayalim are like Yitzchak Avinu on a daily basis being placed on the altar, sacrificing themselves for Hashem and for Klai Yisrael. And we have tremendous Akar Sato for them. Number three. Number three. The Pasuk tells us in Tehillim, bring into the context the, the gullus that the Jewish people experienced um, after Nebuchadnezzar, Melech Babel, came to destroy the first, uh, came to destroy the first temple. On the Haras Babel, Sham Yashavnu, that on the rivers of Babylon, we sat there, Gam Bachinu Bizachrenu Esion, and there we also cried in remembering Zion, remembering Yerushalayim. And while, of course, what they wanted to be doing was not by sitting by the rivers of Babylon and Bavel, they wanted to be sitting by the Kinneret, sitting by the Mediterranean, singing Hashem's praises. There, they had to sit by the rivers of Babylon. And Rashi provides even more context to what was taking place. On the Aras Babel, Sham Yishavnu, Rashi says, Kishiranu Lagola, that we went into exile. Ushalom Nevuchanetzar Harasha, Hashem should eradicate his name. Ushalom Nevuchanetzar, Shiashiru Lo, that the Leviim should sing to him. Imagine this Russia. After he overthrew the Jewish people, sent them into exile, he asked the Leviim, sing for me, the same songs you sang in the temple. This is what Nebuchadnezzar is asking them to do. It's horrible, horrible. But I have a question on the Pasuk. Why is it that it's Amaros Babel, Sham Yashavnu, that there we sat by the rivers of Babylon, Gam Bachinu, and we also cried, Bezochrenu Asion, remembering Yerushalayim and Eretz Yisrael. Why don't we say, Sham Yashavnu Vibachinu? There we sat and cried. What's Gam? Gam is also. It's like two separate actions. Sham Yashavnu, and then Gam Bachinu. And we also cry, separating the two actions. So I think from here, Rashi and the Pasuk is giving us a lesson that in order to cry and in order to mourn over the loss, it needs to begin with a yashavnu. You need to start, first start by sitting and contemplating that which was lost. In order for us to appreciate the chayalim and their sacrifice and the akedos that they do, we need to first stop and reflect. We need to do like what we're doing now. We need to talk about it. We need to sit and reflect. That's what Yom HaZikaron is supposed to be. The day of reflection, of Yashavnu, in order so that we can be Gambachinu. This is something that I witnessed growing up a lot. When um, um, uh, I, I speak about my grandparents often, and my, uh, my, my, my grandparents' home was this tiny little shack 
It's a small little home in Edison, New Jersey. It's a yellow home that uh, was, was distinguished by its uh, handicap ramp that was on the outside of it. It's a small little home, two bedroom house. And um, uh, when you would walk into my grandparents' house, so on the, on the left side, was um, uh, like the, the TV room. They had a, a, a small TV set up there and a couple of couches. And it was a small little uh, living area. And then it would enter into this long um, hallway. Not very long. The whole house was not very big. But it was a long, narrow hallway that you would walk down. You'd pass the dining room on your right side. My grandparents' bedroom would be on the left side. You continue down the hallway a few more steps. You come to the kitchen and then the back nook in 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 the house that was that's the entire layout of the house and when we would come into my grand into my grandparents house my grandmother would always open the door and it's like she just won the lottery that she gets to see you again even though she just saw you a few hours before it was like she won the lottery all over again that she's able to see you and give you another kiss and give you something to eat and so it was always like this like like an event opening the door at my grandparents house like it was always like she opened the door and it's like Hello, like it was always this major big help. But sometimes she'd open the door and instead of us running in, she'd come and almost like quiet us down. And uh, then she'd, she'd say, Shh, you, know, you know, don't interrupt Saba. And, and she'd take us down to the back nook to give us something to eat. And uh, you know, sort of maybe sleeping in it. So when you're walking down the hallway, remember my grandparents' bedroom's on the left side. So you'd be able to look in and I'd see my grandfather sitting in his chair in their bedroom. They have a small little like 10 by 10 little TV, probably about the same size as the computer. And they had hooked up to their bedroom TV, um, the Israeli network, Israeli news, which now obviously you can get everything online. It's not such a big deal. Back then it was a very big deal. And it was something that my father wanted to do for my grandfather to make sure he had the um, uh, Israeli broadcast coming into his bedroom. And um, very often, I mean, I, I would say this had probably happened at least once a month that I'd see my grandfather watching the Israeli news, sitting there crying, sitting there crying. One chayal was killed. There was a terrorist attack. There's a, and every single one he shed tears over. Every single one. Because he spent his whole life, Yashavnu, he spent his whole life appreciating the miracle that is Medina Israel. He spent his entire life appreciating the miracle. He was, he was in Auschwitz for two and a half years, just over the fact that he's a Jew. He helped build the land of Israel. So for him, his whole life was Yashavnu, so therefore, Bachinu was natural for him. But I think for most people that don't have that kind of an appreciation, it's, it's, you, you have to go through the process of a Yom Hazikaron to be Yashavnu, in order so that it could be Gambachino. I think there's a Gemara in Tainus that Rav Kook pointed to that I think Rav, Rav, relates to this exactly and why it's important to go through this process of Yashavnu Gambachino, where the Gemara writes the following. This is a Gemara in Tainus on the Lamed Amabes. Anyone who mourns over Jerusalem is going to merit seeing Jerusalem in its joyous state, meaning rebuilt. You're going to be able to merit to see Mashiach. But if one does not mourn over Jerusalem, is not going to be able to see it in its joyous state. So if Cook asks a very basic question on this Gemara, I don't think that's true. That you're not going to be able to see Jerusalem in its rebuilt state. It's just not, it's just not accurate. We know that, that the whole world is going to know when Mashiach's arrival is. The whole world is going to be able to recognize the fact that Hashem runs the world and that the Jewish people are the chosen nation. That is the whole, we know the whole world is going to recognize this. So then if that's the case, what do you mean? So uh, those that uh, were, were, let's say, uh, not religious Jews that uh, don't uh, observe any of the mourning practices related to the destruction of the temple are just going to be blinded by that. They're not going to, they're just not going to see it. It's just, it's not conceivable that that's the case. We're all going to get push notifications and live streams and from the, uh, coming to you live from 
the, uh, from, from the Temple Plaza in Jerusalem, the Messiah has arrived and the world has perfect order to it. Everyone is going to get that, whether or not you observe Tisha B'Av. So then what does the Gemara mean? So Rav Kook pointed to one of the words in the Gemara that people maybe skim over a little bit. The Gemara says, Kolom Asambli Yushalayim, that anyone that mourns over Jerusalem, Zoha Veroa, not that you're going to be able to merit and see it be binyana in its rebuilt state, but rather, the Gemara says, bisimchasa in its joyous state. Rav Kook point, pointed out that, that everyone's going to see it just a matter of what it's going to mean to you. That when Mashiach finally comes, so those that are going to be uh, spellbound are the ones that put in the most amount of tears on Tisha B'Av. The, those that are really going to be just completely enthralled and have of, the, of, of a joy that is just pure, perfect, unadulterated, unbridled joy is the, the families and the parents of Chayalim, of survivors of the Shoah, of those that really take into account what it is that, that it means to be in Gullus. Those are the ones that are going to be Zoha Veroa Bisimchasa in its joyous state. That, that is why it is so incredibly important for us to have a day like this to be yashavnu and gambachinu, to go through the process of appreciation, to go through the recognition of what the chayalim are doing in, in their akedos that they're doing on a daily basis. We have, to, we have to come to that appreciation because otherwise we're not going to be able to have the same appreciation when finally we see the results of all of that mesiris nefesh, of all that sacrifice, of all those tears, of all of that mourning, of all of the the terrors that Kali Yisrael went through, that when finally we're able to see the light that comes at the end, the Or HaGadol, the Or HaGanos comes back, to the, comes back to the world. So in order for us to appreciate that light, so we need to go through the process of Yashavnu Vigam Bachinu. So I'll just close by mentioning my Rebbe of Rav Herschel Shechter Shlita, um, uh, Kali Yisrael's Rebbe, he... Um, he points out that it's the basic reading of the Gemara in Sanhedrin that we're experiencing the, the, the flowering of the redemption right now. We're beginning, we're seeing the beginning of the redemption. It's, it's, it, he says that the, it's a basic reading of the Gemara. The Gemara in Sanhedrin points out that there are three key elements that um, are required for us to experience the full, um, uh, the full redemption. The three key elements are, number one, is that we need to appoint a melech which the basic understanding of that is that there needs to be a government in the land of Israel. Number two is that the Jewish people need to set up an army to fight against Amalek. We need to set up an army against anyone that is against us. We need to have an army and we need to engage. And number three is we need to engage in battle until Mashiach finally comes. That's what the Gemara says. The Gemara in Sanhedrin on the Chav Amin Beis. The Gemara says that. So, of course, it's obvious then we are experiencing Aschalta de Geula. We're experiencing the beginning of the redemption. And I think by focusing on these three things, by focusing, number one, on the Achtos, the unity that is represented by the Chayalim, the fact that they're not thinking about what they left at home because they're thinking about all of Kal Yisrael, the, the Achtos that they represent. Number two is by, and using that as a model, number two is, through the 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 schus of the akedas yitzchak that is taking place on a daily basis, that is that that is an exponential akedas yitzchak that's happening uh, to an unquantifiable amount on a daily basis. That through the schus of all of those akedos, like the the like the son of Professor Alman and all of the great kedoshim that have died by defending the Jewish people, by standing up for Hakadosh Baruch Hu, for the Jewish people and his land. So that is number two, the second thing for us to focus on and for us to have a Kar Satov over. And number three, and hopefully to elicit the, 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 the mercy from Hashem over to bring the Mashiach. And number three is by going through the process of Yashavnu Gambachinu, of reflecting and then being able to uh, come to the appreciation of what the Chayalim do. So then we're going to be able to experience Roa Be Simchasa. We're going to be able to be Zoha Roa Be Simchasa, seeing uh, Mashiach 
in not only its rebuilt state, but also in its joyous state. So today we sit so that we can better appreciate the Aschata, the Geula that we're experiencing.